Welcome everyone to our fourth monthly connect of Elevink where we have the opportunity to have live audience as we invite a subject matter expert to share their expertise. In this case, we are um, very happy of the topic that we have. It's something that is extremely important for the well-being of our participants in the cohort, but also this month uh, being Mental Wellness uh, Month, October. It's a National Depression and Mental Health Screening Month. It's a uh, the first week of October. It was Mental Illness Awareness Week. We have the National Health Education Week during the third week of October, which is this one. And we also have National Depression Screening Day on October 8th and World Mental Health Day on October 10th. So before I introduce our amazing speaker, I wanted to provide some data points around uh, mental health conditions. And I, I was really, um, I, the word is not impressed. I was, you know, taken back by the high percentage, but mental health conditions are incredibly common. And in any given year, nearly 20% of adults have a mental health condition and over 50% will manage a condition at some points in their lives. Uh, your best employees may have a mental health condition. And this is something that I need to keep reminding myself as we are speaking to our employees and realizing that even those Best employees may be burned out and that we need to care for them. Because of the stigma, most workers don't get the treatment. Eight out of 10 workers with a mental health condition report that shame and stigma prevent them from seeking treatment. So obviously this is something that we would like to talk to Erica about, of how we as leaders can help a coworker. How can we help one of our employees? And a little bit of some of the symptoms of how we might be able to identify um, some of those symptoms as we're speaking to someone, especially now in hybrid environments or as we're um, only inter you know, in exchanging information through a video and not necessarily in person. And then most importantly, and, and very important for corporations, addressing mental health at work results in major cost savings. By some estimates, approximately according to the business group Health, 17 billion is lost in productivity annually when organizations fail to support employees with mental health conditions. So um, just some data to get us grounded and level set in regards of the importance of this topic. And now uh, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague and um, co-founders. We're co-founders of an organization together. So she can talk a little bit more about that, but let me um, tell you a little bit of her bio. Uh, Erika Sandoval is a passionate licensed clinical therapist who is dedicated to promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion. She is committed to amplifying the voices and businesses of incredible Latinx social work leaders who are healing and inspiring communities. She partners with organizations, university, healthcare facilities, medical and corporate professionals to provide access to resources to advance teams and help employees and students thrive. Most recently, she co-founded Employee Network Alliance, a space for allyship for today and tomorrow's employee network leaders who help each other succeed. Erica holds a post-master's in clinical adolescent psychology and a master's in social work from New York University, Silver School of Social Work. She currently serves as the president of the board of directors for National Association of Social Workers of New York City, the largest organization for professional social work worldwide. She helped launch BOLD, Building, Organizing, and Leading with Diversity. Her work focuses on the intersectionality of behavioral health, social disparities, trauma, and human development. She serves as an advisor for Latino Social Work Coalition in Prospanica, New York. Her successful career earned her numerous awards, and she's regularly invited to be a guest speaker, moderator, and panelist by well-known organizations. Her greatest pride is raising her 21-year-old daughter, Isabella, as a single mother, who she considers her biggest teacher. As a proud immigrant from Ecuador, her passion is fueled in supporting the community she's part of and their children. She has released her first book, Latinx and Social Work, quickly becoming a number one bestseller and hot new release under Social Work on Amazon. Wow, Erika, I am so proud. I'm still so happy about that December when we had an opportunity to sit next to each other and we just spent the whole night speaking and getting to know each other. Since then, you have been a huge advocate of elevating and supporting the Young Latina Talks. 
And just from a personal perspective, you have been a great friend and a great colleague, and I'm just very, very honored to have you here tonight, sharing with us, the audience, uh, a little bit about of your background. So tell us a little bit about you. How did you select your career? How did this girl from Ecuador realize that she wanted to become a social worker? And uh, and tell us a little bit about what is the, that path looked like for you? Hi, Claudia. Thank you so much first for having me, Claudia and Joanna. So excited to be here and to share space with all of you who are here today. Um, you know, I came to this country at four years old and my parents, we're not together at this time. So my parent, my mom came here with me and we experienced a lot of trauma as immigrants. And I didn't realize how much trauma that I was um, holding on to as a child. And so throughout my life, I lived with all of these narratives in my head as my memories. And I always loved psychology. I just, I was so attracted to my guidance counselor. I love going into her office and talking to her. I always felt so good when I walked out of her office. I was always part of the group therapies that she would have for teenagers. And it was just such a wonderful space to open up and to feel like you were heard and like you were seen and that there was someone there that held like a safe space for you. So that was my first love psychology. And I didn't know how I was going to become a guidance counselor. I had no idea what it took to do that. And so the world kind of like shifted in its own pattern and its own way. And I ended up going into my second love, which was the music industry. And I was there for about 10 years. I worked at record labels, radio stations. I was in the marketing publicity team. And fast forward, I had my daughter and I could not do that anymore. The hours were not conducive to the way I wanted to raise her. And so I went back to school as soon as she was one and I started going towards my first love and and uh, and got my bachelor's in, in uh, at Baruch. And I fell in love with it again. And I realized what it was. It was about stories. It was about the narratives that each person has. It was human behavior. It's understanding the mind and why we do the things that we do. I really wanted to understand my family. That was the reason why I went into social work school. I didn't go into social work school saying, oh, I'm going to be a social worker. It kind of found me. And I talk a little bit about that in my chapter. And very briefly, I was often the translator for my mother and so, and my father and my uncles. And there was a moment where I was translating for her. And she, unfortunately, she didn't get that position at uh, the hospital for special surgery. And I had just graduated with my bachelor's. I was making a lot of money on my own waiting tables. Like you would be surprised how much, you know, you can make in the service industry. And I love the service industry. And I was doing that for so many years. And I was like, why would I want to you know, I want to just get a job at a school, work eight to four, and then wait tables at night, some nights and bartend, just have the best life. And that's not what happened. It, it just kind of like life just took a spin. The HR um, director asked me, they're like, you know, are you, uh, are you, are you, did you graduate from college? And I said, yes, I did. They're like, what was your degree? In? And I said, it's, it's clinical adolescent and psychology. They're like, we have a position that not sure if you would be interested, but would you want to apply for it? Meanwhile, I just told my mom that she wasn't qualified for the job. So I was translating that. My mom's listening to me speak to this HR person. And my mom's looking at me like, you better say yes. Like those eyes that a mom looks at you like, don't you dare, don't you dare not, not take that opportunity. And I interviewed for the position and I went into the Department of Social Work, the hospital for special surgery. And I was surrounded by all these incredible social workers with all these credentials right after their names. And I just didn't think I could do it because I knew how many years it would take. But little did I know that social work picked me. I always had the love for people. I've always wanted to support my community and the universe and God just put me right in the right path to get to get to where I need to be to today. So it, it definitely picked me. 
Thank you for sharing that. So tell us a little bit about what can someone expect when they're being treated by a licensed social worker? Like, I don't want to assume that it's the same treatment as a psychologist or a therapist. So tell us a little bit more about what can they expect? What does the treatment look like? What do the sessions look like? Share with us, please. Absolutely. So there's such we want to reduce the stigma of what it looks like to be in therapy or to be in sessions and social workers have many different niches as we we like to call them so for example a social worker can really um, specialize in depression and treating um, OCD or treating and OCD is obsessive compulsive disorder or treating um, eating disorder so every social worker has a specific niche and when you're working with a social worker, you may be seeing a licensed master's in social work that are still obtaining their hours under a clinical social worker. So you'll have an LMSW licensed social worker. After completing 3000 hours, it's almost like a fellowship, like a residency, you go for a second exam and you submit all these hours. And then once you pass it, you become a licensed clinical social worker. And that's when you are more, um, you have more experience and you're able to support in unfortunately the diagnosing of clients just for insurance purposes. Um, but you have a person that is their own mental health provider in their own practice. So you might have an LMSW or an LCSW compared to a psychologist and a, psych a psychiatrist. A psychiatrist usually are prescribers of medication. They manage your medication and they might see you for 20 minutes maybe tops 30 minutes. It's not often that they see you for long periods of time because sometimes psychiatrists work in in parallel with the mental health provider. So you might have a talk therapy and then someone that manages your medication. And the expectation is what you make of it. It's like dating. You want to find the right the right therapist for you. You want to be able to connect with the person. You want to be able to feel safe and comfortable, understood and seen. And it's it's so important to know that you're the, your boss. You're the person that decides who's the right fit for you. You're the one that's in control. And that's so important to know that the power is in the client's hands because you want to be able to feel safe, secure and and connect it because this is going to be your person. This is going to be the person you go to on a weekly basis for 45 to 53 minutes. That's usually how long the sessions last and you're unpacking and it can come up with anything. You're coming in with your whole self, what's happening that week. It could be something that you're trying to process um, in the past three months. It could be a life transition. It could be, a, which could mean work, like maneuvering different professional careers or navigating a transition of your, maybe your kids are, are leaving to college, or maybe you're getting a divorce, or maybe you're getting married, or maybe you're having a child. It could be, it could be anything. It could be uh, major transitions. It could be that you're a caretaker for your parents or, uh, or a loved one, and you're having anxiety and you're, and things are coming up for you. And you just want to unpack and, and really be heard and, and, and talk to someone that can support you and hold space for you to help you through that process. Thank you. Now switching a little bit about the book. I know that the book launched at the beginning of October. It's I think it's only two weeks right on October 5th, the launching. Now it's a number one bestseller. Tell me a little bit about what inspired you to move forward with this book. Well, yeah, this has been such a passion project for me and Latinx and Social Work is uh, a book about all of us, all of us, all of us um, in social work that identifies Latinx and the struggles and the challenges that we have faced navigating our career, really unpacking our past, our traumas, our intergenerational traumas, which means everything our parents and ancestors have gone through that we still carry. And so it's really a space that we have created for ourselves to own our personal narratives. And that has empowered us and 
also has supported our own healing. We're usually the, the, the individuals that are sitting on the other side of the couch, really listening and hearing and supporting in the healing process of our clients. This is this was really a movement of healing ourselves and giving space to others to read our personal narratives and making sure that they don't feel alone, that they are they are validated for, for the thoughts that they're having or for the feelings that they're having that we often don't speak about. It's a lot of unspoken thoughts that are in this book that are now written in the pages. And what happens is, is that when you start reading one, one of the author's chapters, you're going to start identifying a little bit more with that individual or maybe many, many people that are also reading it. And now you're naming common and unspoken struggles and by just naming them and bringing it to an awareness the healing process begins so we really wanted to create a collective of narratives to inspire and heal our communities and to also support in bringing more uh, individuals into the field that identify as latinx that are bilingual, bicultural, that can speak the language, that can understand the different culturas of, 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 of our communities to help our communities heal. Because what happens is, is that we often don't have a wide range of therapists to pick from. And so um, I, I predominantly uh, work with Latinx professionals and individuals that are in biracial relationships with Latinx identified individuals. That's the work that I do because um, they want to be able to um, unpack with someone that can understand and not having to explain it. When I was seeing a clinical therapist uh, many years ago, I it, this woman was amazing, but she, she was not Latina and I knew that I had to explain a lot of things. And even though I helped, it was an incredible moment of healing and it was, it was a great experience for me. I didn't feel as connected to a person that I'm speaking with now who is able to understand when I'm talking about, you know, my a conversation I had with um, with my mother and how I can't really move away from her or like have boundaries because that's not in the culture to like just set complete boundaries. Like I'm not going to call her for a week. That doesn't even make sense to some of our families. Right. So it's it's really being able to to identify and be seen and even speak the same language. A lot of uh, the work that we do in our in our community as social workers that we speak in Spanish. There's a, not a lot of therapists that speak in Spanish and that can support the first generation and their parents to really understand what their children are experiencing navigating careers i mean i'm sure and i love your, your everything that you have always been doing like latina talks like listening to all these incredible latinas navigating their careers and knowing that their parents may not understand what they're doing they may not understand it one because of the language two because of um they're not in that same space and and their children are are moving in a different in a different path it's really really hard so to be able to be that therapist for the family and help them heal and move along with them is so uplifting and empowering. So we really want to create a movement of creating more incredible social workers to support our community. So our mental health and well-being will no longer be at risk. And I want to tell our audience, for those of you who are joining us today, that we will be raffling um, the book autographed by Erica. Erica will be chipping it to the person that gets selected. So thank you for that. And um, the last question, we really try to ensure that through this connects, we're giving people three to five things that they can act upon. Um, I want you to determine, you know, like how, how should they be thinking about if they're worried about their mental health or one of the relatives mental health or things that they can do to improve their mental health, especially thinking around the, the workplace or, or thriving at the workplace. So if you can finish with that thought, that will be great. So a couple of thoughts. 
sometimes it comes up in different ways. We're not really sure what's happening with our loved one or with our partner or with our our colleagues or our team members. And it just comes up in different, very small behaviors. It could be irritability. It could be isolation. It could be just pulling away, maybe not spending as much time with um, people that they often have or, in, or doing the things that they often enjoy doing. It could mean, you know, uh, weight gain or sudden weight gain or sudden weight loss or lacking sleep um, and not having the energy, being fatigued. So we're not sure what's happening, but we know the symptoms, right? So first thing, you have to recognize the symptoms and really understand that it's, it's okay to not be okay. And that's one thing we have to normalize that we are human beings and we're not always going to be on point every day of our lives. We're not always going to show up a hundred percent. There are some days that we might feel a lot less than a hundred percent. So normalizing that it's okay to not be okay is number one. And also just kind of picking up on the cues. And then once you, once you realize that maybe there is something that's happening, asking questions instead of offering advice. The number one thing I would say is not to say you need a therapist. That is very demoralizing. And it's almost as if you are stigma you we're trying to reduce the stigma but then by saying you need a therapist it's almost like you are stigmatizing their their emotions so it's just asking the questions and saying what do you what you know just really getting to a place where they are trusting in you and even if you are seeing someone you can normalize it by saying you know I find it really helpful to speak to someone. I have an incredible person. Let, let me know if you want me to connect you to them. I'll give you their their contact info. That's so different than saying, "Hey, you know what? You need to, you need to find a therapist." And sometimes we do that. We don't even realize it, and then it's and then they they withdraw more, and then they start kind of thinking, "Is there something wrong with me?" And there's nothing wrong with us. You know, we often need someone to talk to. Right now, mental health has been the hot topic because we all experienced one thing in common across the globe, the pandemic. So we've been we've been faced with anxiety, depression, um, change management, changing of navigating the workplace, working remotely while having your kids, working remotely when you don't have the space and maybe not even having security job security and navigating that and financial distress there's a lot that has happened and and we're not even touching on the grief and the loss that we've experienced by perhaps losing a loved one or being traumatized by seeing so many losses in 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 our community and in the world so there's a lot of ptsd and trauma and that can come up differently as well so what i always say to employees and team members and also colleagues is helping reduce the stigma and normalizing by also leaning in with your own feelings as well saying you know this has been this has really affected and impacted me in this that and this way um and then trying to start a conversation and maybe holding space by creating groups there's there's restorative healing circles that been, that can be creative through um, teams. Um, you can ask your uh, budget to support mental health wellness programs and bring in incredible social workers that can connect and really really have very meaningful dialogue. We do know that exercise would help our mental well-being, mental health. We do know that meditation, mindful meditation, um, doing things that are enjoyable, those are things we know of, right? We have all these incredible apps that we can listen to before we go to bed, the white space. We do on all, we do know all of that. But the number one thing that supports mental health and well-being is community and feeling less alone and less isolated and then building that community and normalizing these conversations and then creating tools and resources which they can access easily without shame. Thank you. And, you know, when you were talking about community, I, I was thinking about the 
developing ecosystem and what we try to do. And that's exactly what we try to do. We try to build a community of people who are willing to mentor each other, who are willing to support each other. And in the cohorts, we have these conversations. And I think that at the end, when we get the survey results, they normally share how it helped them through that period of time to achieve their, you know, their next step, their next dreams, or to complete that that step that they were do, going through by that having that sense of community and that sense of support. So thank you for, for sharing that. Um, so now I am going to uh, thank you and I thank you so much for joining us for this session. We hope, hope you know that you can join us in our next recording. Have a great night. <laughs>